Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our lavish, spectacular new production of one of, if not the most iconic opera in the literature, which is Giacomo Puccini's Tosca. Um, and it is one of the barnstormers. Never was such a theatrical piece of music uh, put to paper. Um, it's been a staple of the repertoire ever since it was first performed. Uh, it's never left, and it's still in the top five most performed operas, and you're going to see why. It's actually not my favorite music of Puccini. I think some of his most beautiful scores are Madame Butterfly and Rondinet. I have a special place in my heart for Rondinet. But certainly in terms of his strength, which is pure theater, there is nothing to beat Tosca. If you're going to bring your friends to a first opera, Tosca is the one to do it. Uh, let's just think. We have two murders, two on, sorry, two suicides in the course of the show, an on-stage murder at the hands of a woman, we have a torture scene, we have a live firing squad execution, we have attempted rape and terrible blasphemy, all in the case of this, this short two and a half hour piece of music. So it's everything you could possibly want. It's, um, Bel, um, Bel Canto is the beginning of sort of Italian opera as we know it. And then we had Giuseppe Verdi who took over the helm. And we call Verdi Bel Canto on steroids. Well, the next step after this, Puccini is the heir to Verdi. Uh, and we have Verismo, and Tosca is a Verismo opera. And I suppose, um, you know, um, Verismo could be described as not Bel Canto, not Bel Canto on steroids, but Bel Canto on steroids perhaps playing in a Telemondo soap opera. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's just glorious stuff and designed for the theater. So, Tosca is one of those pieces that is so taught theatrically that I think it behooves us to investigate where it comes from, why we have such good theater. Well, it's a collaboration between this great master of the theatre and his two favourite librettists, who are Giacosa and Illica. And they are a great team. It's like Mozart and Da Ponte, or Verdi and Boito, or Bellini and Romani. Uh, they work very well together. Not personally, Puccini terrorized these poor guys. He, he drove them up the wall uh, with corrections and alterations. Uh, but their libretto is based on a play called La Tosca by Victorien Sardou, who was famous for writing very lengthy, long-winded, historically accurate pieces of theater. And he was very popular um, with opera librettists. They liked to make uh, operas out of his works. So La Tosca was terribly popular because it starred the very famous, the legendary French histrionic, melodramatic actress, Sarah Bernhardt. Uh, and she made this play famous all over the world. In America, it was performed in French to great success. When it was translated into English, it actually caused a major scandal when people actually understood what was going on uh, because of these themes of murder and suicide. Um, but all of these composers heard Tosca in the theater as a straight play, and Verdi said, if he'd been a younger man, he would have turned it into an opera. Um, George Bernard Shaw said, oh, such an empty-headed ghost of a shocker, if it had but been an opera. So Puccini knew he was onto a good thing. He saw this play, uh, and he saw it in French and understood hardly a word. But he recognized good theater, perhaps by the applause, perhaps by uh, the audience going wild for Sarah Bernhardt, and he knew he had the makings of an opera. So, after some discussion, it was originally uh, uh, palmed off by his agent, Ricordi, to a different composer, but eventually it comes into Puccini's hands and he starts writing this masterwork. Now, to make it work, he contracted this huge, unwieldy, classical tragedy by Victorian Sardou from five acts down to three. And what if there is a criticism that's leveled at it, it's that this contraction for theatrical purposes is so strong that we lose a lot of the histo historical background, both of what's going on politically and also of the characters. So I think you should know a little bit about the historical background. 
So here we are at the turn of the 19th century. It's 1800, and we're in Rome. What's going on in the world? Well, Europe is in total turmoil. This is at the head of the Enlightenment. Europe is reeling from the French and the American revolutions, and the Enlightenment has its principles of liberté and fraternité and égalité. And these are supported by the Republicans, the people, the people for the people, pushing these libertarian ideals. And the things that caused the revolution, those huge institutions of power, of oppressive power, are what the Republicans are railing against. And that's the monarchies, these aristocratic, lineaged monarchies that have been oppressing the general public for many hundreds of years before the revolutions happened. So we have a battle. It's the classic battle in, in politics, conservatives versus libertarians. And on the one side, we have the Republicans, representing the ideals of the Enlightenment with people like Voltaire, Locke, Jefferson, Rousseau. And then on the other side, we have the conservatives, and these are the royalists. And the Republicans, the figurehead of the Republicans, is a short guy by the name of Napoleon Bonaparte. He is their spirit animal, if you wish. And he is marching all over Europe. At the height of his empire, he ruled over some 70 million people, an empire that was as wide as the Roman Empire ever achieved. And he is the voice of the people. Uh, actually, he later crowned himself emperor, and that's when Beethoven scratches out his uh, Eroica Symphony dedication, because he thought this was against the principles of the Republicans and freedom and liberty and egality. So, our tenor hero is a Republican, and he's on the side of Napoleon. And Napoleon is battling his way through the Alps as that glorious portrait of him, you know, Napoleon crosses the Alps on his horse. Uh, and there's this big battle against the Austrian troops, which is headed by General Melas. This actually happened. Uh, and news gets through to Rome that Melas has won. And all of the royalists are delighted at this news. But the news is incorrect, because Napoleon rallies his troops and eventually soundly defeats General Melas. And that's when Cavaradosri cries, Vittoria, Vittoria, in the middle of the opera, that great moment. So that's sort of politically what's going on. And in Rome, Rome was ruled by the Kingdom of Naples uh, and had all manner of nationalities with forces there trying to keep Napoleon out. So Rome is a tyrannical police state. Obviously, the church is very powerful there, but it's a tyrannical police state. And that chief of police is Il Barone Scarpia. And he is the driving force behind this opera. It is his leitmotif that we hear first. That's Scarpia coming into our world and creeping into the opera at all points, even after his death in Act 3. We, we get senses of this, even, even when the shepherd is on stage. Little hints of Scarpia. So, Let's go into these three characters, now that we know a little bit about historically what's going on and the battles that we have. So we have Tosca, we have her lover, Cavaradossi, and we have one of the greatest villains in all of opera, Il Barone Scarpia, who is the chief of police. And they have historical background in the play that it would be good for you to know a little of, because it fleshes out their characters. Um, and let's start, uh, I have the wonderful Shannon Prickett here, who is covering the role of Tosca. Let's start by meeting our central character, Floria Tosca. Who is Tosca? Where does she come from? Well, in the play, she starts life as a goat herder. She's an orphan, and she herds goats in the hills of Rome. Uh, and she's... The, the nuns at a convent, the Bene Benedictine nuns, take pity on her, take her into the convent, um, and train her as a singer. She has a beautiful voice. And later in life, the composer Cimarosa, who actually existed, discovers Tosca and says, oh, you're marvelous, you have to sing for the Pope. And Tosca sings before the Pope, and she makes the Pope cry. And the Pope releases her from her duties as a nun and says, 
you will cause other people to cry, and those tears are as good as prayers. So she becomes the first professional woman in opera. She's self-supporting. She earns a living as a prima donna, as a, as a professional singer. And this is Floria Tosca. Uh, and we meet her uh, disarmed. We meet the real Tosca. She comes into this chapel to meet her lover, Cavaradossi, who's a painter and an aristocrat. We'll hear about him later. Uh, and we see Tosca as she really is. She's a little bit jealous. Um, she's always suspicious that Cavaradossi is going to run off with someone else. Uh, she's terribly feminine. She's terribly cutesy. She's quite romantic. And she's going to sing you a little aria about their little casetta, their little secret villa. Uh, which is hidden away from everyone else where they can go for their nighttime trysts. Uh, and you're going to see, um, uh, she's going to talk about the smell of time and the stars and the nighttime and everything that makes this place special to this couple. So this is Tosca, and she's going to sing, Non la sospiri la nostra casetta. Do you not long for our lovely little villa? And you'll have to excuse my voice as uh, the poet Cavaradossi at the end. <clears throat> Story, romantic, kind of playful, that little D um, bum, ba, da, 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 is the theme that goes with their secret villa. Uh, and she is like any tragic heroine. In fact, Sardou, the playwright, modeled her on the uh, Aristotelian uh, from his poetics, the, the classical tragic heroines of old. So she has a single fault. Her fatal flaw is jealousy, uh, and she has a five-act structure which goes up to its height in the middle, and then it has its sort of cathartic release at the end. And she goes on a journey from ignorance, this sort of jealous lover, to knowledge. And at the end of the piece, she's almost an avenging angel, like the angel that you'll see that's on the Castel Sant'Angelo that we have as part of our set. So she's, a, she's, she's the subject. 
uh, and she is to be tortured like most of Puccini's heroines by one of the great villains. But before we talk about Scarpia, let's talk about her lover, Cavaradossi. Now, Cavaradossi is a great poet, um, a, a great painter, uh, and an aristocrat, and you'll hear from him in his opening aria, Recondit Armonia, so famous I don't even need to play it. Um, and his second aria, which occurs at the beginning of Act Three, is perhaps one of the most famous tenor arias of all time, um, El Ucevan Le Stelle. Um, and it starts with this wonderful theme. haunting as he awaits his death before the firing squad. E luce van le stelle Unforgettable. And actually Puccini wrote the music for that aria before he even wrote the words. He had a moment of inspiration in the middle of the night, which is when he did most of his composing, uh, and he wrote the whole song and then said to his librettists, write words for it, that's going to be the music. <laughs> it has to be like this. Uh, so you can tell by just how, how sort of free form and freewheeling that melody is. It's not pinned down by any text at all. So Cavaradossi, it's a wonderful name. It's sort of modeled perhaps on the painter Caravaggio uh, or the noble Genoese name Caravadossi with the V and the R reversed. Um, but it's a, a fascinating sort of artistic name to go with the character. And he, he was actually born in Paris. He's not Italian. And 1800 is the first time that he's come to Rome. So he's obviously met his Tosca, his lover, um, all of a sudden. And suddenly his life spirals out of control when this political prisoner, a friend of his, escapes from the Castel Sant'Angelo, Angelotti, and runs in at the beginning of the opera. So we have one more central character, and this is our villain, Scarpia, and I've already played you his motif. And he is, he's a connoisseur of evil, this man. Uh, he is um, an aristocrat, and he has this sort of sadistic detachment from all of the pain and anguish that he um, causes. We learn in the play that he actually likes to arrange for prisoners' releases so that he can torture them and then have his way with their female friends, pretending to get information out of them. So he's a serial um, uh, rapist, if you like it. I mean, he really is a terrible, terrible man in the play. Uh, and he uses his power for every uh, dirty purpose that he can come across. Um, so that's Scarpia. And I need, I need to say no more. Um, he's a figure of power and violence. And in our production, and in several productions, that symbol of power is connected to the huge finale at the end of Act One, the great Te Deum, because the Italian Catholic Church and the Vatican is, uh, features throughout this, um, and is a symbol of rather dangerous power if we think about the Inquisition. So he's connected to that. And we have one more character in this grand opera, and a grand opera it is, and that is the city of Rome. And this is one of the greatest of the Roman operas. And it's set in three locations, and they actually exist. Hence that wonderful film with uh, Placido Domingo, which was filmed on location. Uh, and the first one, the great church, and we turn the whole theater into a church, is uh, the, the chapel of Sant'Andrea della Valle, which is a beautiful um, Renaissance sort of church with those painted ceilings like Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel. It's full of Bernini sculptures. It has the side chapels that are mentioned. There is no Atavanti Chapel, as it appears in the opera, but there are other chapels that even have secret hiding places, such as where Angelotti might have been. And then the second act is set at the Palazzo Farnese, one of the grandest of the Renaissance palaces. It's now the French embassy, in fact, and the, the French government pays the Italian government one euro a month for its rent uh, in Rome. And it is a grand thing, actually designed partially by Michelangelo himself. And the final act, uh, the denouement, uh, the catharsis of this great drama, is set at the Castel Sant'Angelo. 
and that's a very imposing building at the end of the Aeolian Bridge in Rome. It's a cylindrical fortress built as Hadrian's tomb in the second century AD, and then it became a Vatican fortress where political prisoners were held, and it has this angel, St. Michael, sitting on the top of this sculpture, which was added in the 17th century, uh, and People saw visions of St. Michael on the Castel Sant'Angelo when the plague came to an end. And they said that they saw him sheathing his sword now that the carnage was over. So that's where that wonderful sculpture that you will see uh, in Act 3 comes from, that sculpture of um, St. Michael. So there are the three settings. You'll see and you'll hear Rome all the way throughout this opera. Uh, the great uh, evocative musical opening with bells all over the theatre. Uh, Puccini actually got by getting up at 4 a.m. and standing on Castel Sant'Angelo and notating the sound of the church bells exactly as he heard it. And the final bell that you hear is the Campanone, the lowest bell in the Vatican, uh, St. Peter's grand lowest bell, the low E. And that heralds in this wonderful, that death knell. So Rome is the final character for this setting. Uh, it needs no more hype, Tosca. It is one of the great pieces of theater. And I'm going to finish with Shannon singing one of the most famous of all soprano ar arias. And it's Tosca's motto for life. She's railing against her fate as a tragic heroine uh, and all the evil Scarpia is doing to her. She says, I've lived for art, I've lived for love, and this is how you repay me, Lord. So this is the great Visidarte. Uh, from the from the conclusion of Act Two.
I'm really very proud of this new production. Uh, it is as lavish as we get here at Minnesota Opera. Uh, it's a big showpiece for my chorus as well as for our magnificent soloists. Uh, but Tosca is, I don't know, it's the musical equivalent of the Super Bowl. Uh, you can cheer for Napoleon, you can cheer for Tosca and Cavaradossi. Uh, you know what the outcome is going to be and it's not good, uh, but it's worth cheering all the same. Uh, so get behind your favorite team and have a wonderful night in the theater. Thank you very much.